slot. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, my name is Chris. It's a great privilege to be able to talk to you today. I was trying to say before the call cut out, I'm a card carrying statistician and not a mathematician. So it's a particular privilege to be able to uh, speak to mathematicians today. Thank you very much to all the organizers. So my, um, uh, my area of interest is Bayesian statistics. Some of you will be familiar with this already. For those who are not, the object of Bayesian uh, the object of interest in Bayesian statistics is something called a posteriori distribution. It characterizes uncertainty about some parameter or, or sort of physical quantity of interest on the basis of data that have been collected, usually experimentally. So for the purposes of this talk, um, capital P will be our posteriori distribution. Uh, we're going to assume everything has a density with respect to a, a Lebesgue measure on Euclidean space, and so no, no measure theory is going to be needed for this talk. I use lowercase pi's for all the densities. Theta will denote the, uh, the, the parameters that I'm interested in quantifying my uncertainty about, and ideally um, uh, drawing scientific conclusions from. And Y will be the data that I have available. These might have come from a physical experiment, for example. And the famous Bayes' theorem uh, expresses this posterior probability density in terms of three other quantities the probability density of the data given the parameters, a prior probability of the parameters, and a marginal likelihood. And the role of the marginal likelihood is, is to normalize this probability density function on the left-hand side here. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about where the prior distribution comes from or how we come up with the likelihood. This is, um, these are other aspects of statistical methodology. What I'm gonna talk about today is how one should attempt to numerically approximate this posterior distribution for the purposes of operationalizing a Bayesian inference. Okay, so the principal technical challenge is computation of the posterior distribution. Okay, so actually we can write this thing down um, on paper very easily in, in many situations, but computing it is challenging. <clears throat> the reason for the the, the difficulty is that this denominator, which I call the marginal likelihood, is a, in, in principle a integral. Uh, it's the integral of the product of the prior probability density function with the, 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 the likelihood, the probability of the data given the parameters. Uh, if, um, if the parameter is d-dimensional, then this is a d-dimensional integral, and as you are all very well aware, high-dimensional integration can be challenging in some situations. You can imagine, for example, that um, uh, the data support a variety of parameter values, or at least there are a variety of parameter values that are consistent with experimentally observed data. And um, the, essentially the sort of the, the nature of those parameters that are consistent with data determines the difficulty of this integral. Okay, so we know many approaches um, to numerical integration. Um, yet 90% of 90% is just the number I'm making up, but essentially 90% of Bayesian analyses are conducted using a particular numerical method called Markov chain Monte Carlo. Now that's not a quadrature rule. It's a, a sampling based procedure, which is in some sense like Monte Carlo, except that the samples are not independent. And Markov chain Monte Carlo emerged as a solution to a really challenging problem. The challenge is that the numerator of this expression is something that's typically computable, but the denominator is not. In Markov chain Monte Carlo, we construct a p invariant Markov chain whose um, long time average distribution, sometimes called the ergodic distribution, is with p. That's what p invariance means. And the, the, the power of Markov chain Monte Carlo is it completely circumvents the need to evaluate this normalizing constant, this intractable integral. Okay, but MCMT is not a silver bullet. Um, there are particular applications where uh, other numerical methods, including quadrature, prove very successful. Um, but for um, the, the increasingly challenging uh, statistical models that we are um, hoping to analyze, Markov and Monte Carlo can fail. Okay, so here's, a, here's a picture of what can go wrong in practice. This is just a cartoon, actually. This, this is not a hard problem, but I want to uh, explain what the challenges are in an intuitive way. So suppose that these contours here in the left panel our, uh, sorry, are our posterior distribution. Okay, we, we won't know what those contours look like in general because we are not able to normalize this, this thing. Well, I suppose you could draw contours without normalizing, but anyhow, this is our posterior. 
And this is what a realization of a Markov chain Monte Carlo method looks like. So this particular one was initialized in the top left corner of the display, and it wandered around in essentially a stochastic way, such that the long run probability of it visiting any particular area in the domain is proportional to the probability associated with that area under the posterior distribution. Okay, so these things, if you run them long enough, will, will average out to give you the right frequencies of probabilities for different regions of the domain. But in practice, we can't run these things infinitely long. We stop them eventually. And then we hope that the sample path of the process is a good empirical approximation to the posterior. And often it's not. And it, it can fail to be for a number of reasons, but you can imagine that the posterior could be really rather complicated, the dimension could be very high, and actually running a Markov chain to equilibrium is not feasible. So it would be great if we could fix this situation somehow, or at least improve it. And what are the sort of things we would like to be able to do? Well, we would like to identify this initial period um, as being irrelevant, let's say. Okay, So the true posterior doesn't place much probability density in, in, in the stakes visited. Um, initially. They're just a, an artifact due to where the chain was initialized. So we'd like to be able to identify that part of the, of the sample path and remove it. And we'd also like to um, deal with the fact that this Markov chain jumps between these two high probability regions somewhat infrequently, such that actually if you look at this sample path, it spent more time in the bottom left region compared to the top right region. Yeah, that's just because it hasn't had enough opportunity to jump many times between these regions such that the frequencies of visiting each region have equilibrated. So we would like to somehow correct for the fact that this sample path is placing too much mass in the bottom left hand corner of this display. Okay, so these are all things that we'd like to do. Um, of course, designing better mixing Markov chains is one way to do that. Um, th there might be many ways to do that, but the way that I'm gonna try and do it in this talk uh, it's represented in the third panel here. So what I'm gonna aim to do is to select a subset of the states that were visited by the Markov chain in such a way that the empirical approximation provided by that subset is a better approximation to the posterior compared to the raw sample path. So these red dots uh, are a sort of cartoon that illustrates what I'd like to achieve. I'd like to completely ignore the, the initial um, part of the sample path and I'd like to select approximately as many samples from the bottom left region as the top right region. Okay. And a, a further um, desiderata here is actually compression. Okay, so not only have I improved the empirical approximation in this cartoon by just keeping the red dots, the red states, uh, I've actually compressed that posterior distribution into um, a, a relatively small number of states. And that often has advantages in statistical applications because we might want to propagate our parameter uncertainty through, for example, a computer model. And each red dot that I keep corresponds to a computer simulation that has to be run. So compression at this stage of a Bayesian analysis often pays off uh, in the next stage of an analysis. Okay, so that's the goal. Um, yeah, you can summarize it in quotes. So pick a representative subset from the MCMC app. Uh, so if we, if we want to try and sort of formulate an equation for this, it's uh, well, you, you might you might come up with something like this. So uh, this let theta one to theta n be the MCMC output. That's the states visited by the Markov chain. And you might attempt to select a subset of these of a fixed cardinality, let's say m, where you know, typically m will be much smaller than n. Uh, and how would we select that, that subset? Well, we would potentially want to minimize some notion of the difference between the empirical measure supported on that subset s and the posterior distribution that we're trying to approximate. Okay, so ideas like this are you know, probably somewhat familiar, but there are, there are particular challenges that, that arise when trying to implement an idea like this in a Bayesian setting. And the main one, of course, is we don't know what P is. Okay, so if we knew P was a Gaussian, then we've got you know, all sorts of um, quadrature rules and so on available to us. Uh, but we don't know that P is a Gaussian. We don't really know what P is at all. So that's a, a first challenge. How are we actually gonna measure the difference between an empirical distribution and a distribution that we don't know? 
And the second challenge is that even if we could measure this difference in some way, well, potentially the, the, the act of selecting representative points uh, is actually quite hard as well. So it could be a combinatorially difficult optimization problem. Well, what I'm going to try and do in this talk is present, um, I suppose I should call them partial solutions to these problems. We're going to construct a computable measure of the difference, and we're going to um, replace the, uh, the combinatorial, the hard optimization problem with, it, with an easy optimization problem. And then we're going to show that everything works. So how do we do this? Well, our strategy is to appeal to a um, powerful idea in applied probability. It's called Stein's method. Stein's method is going to be the key that allows us to manufacture a computable notion of the, uh, the, the difference between the empirical measure and the posterior that doesn't require any uh, high dimensional integration. Um, I think from the participants list um, and from the, the, the morning talks, I can basically assume everyone's familiar with reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Um, so for the purposes of this slide, lowercase k is going to be my re reproducing kernel. And I'm going to define it on the, um, on, on, on the set of values that the parameter theta is able to take. Okay. So if we are um, uh, looking to measure the difference between probability distributions, uh, one quite natural way to do that is to consider the difference in expectations under a rich set of test functions. So what I'm going to do here is take test functions from the unit ball of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that's denoted HK. And I'm going to, uh, for each test function F, compare the difference between the empirical average that I get by averaging um, the value of F over the, the, the red dots in my figure against the true expectation of F if I were able to compute with the posterior distribution. Um, that's gonna be my measure of the difference, my, my way of quantifying the difference between the empirical approximation and the posterior. And I want to emphasize that we're interested in selecting a subset of states here. So I'm gonna use this um, notation below, which I'll, I'll get to in a second, which basically expresses this as a, as a function of the theta that are included in the empirical approximation. Okay. Now, why did I talk about reproducing kernels? Well, I, I expect most of you uh, already know this very well. Um, we can simplify uh, some of the computation. So if I use the reproducing property that allows me to express any function in the RKHS as the inner product of itself with a translate of the kernel, and I'm able to, uh, to directly substitute F with inner products here, exploit linearity of the inner products, and exploit cauchy schwartz to remove the supremum over the test functions. So that's, uh, that's, that's slightly more computable. And as I said, I'm going to denote this in a way that emphasizes the, the particular role of the red dots in uh, the choice of the approximation. Okay, So you'll recognize this as the worst case error in the uniform of the RKHS. And of course, we can go a little bit further. Um, this RKHS norm is, is often abstract. You know, only for certain kernels do we know what, what this is concretely. So we need to evaluate this somehow, but we can do that. So if we square this measure of the difference, this worst case error, uh, expand it, exploit linearity of the inner product, exploit the reproducing property, we arrive at a well-known uh, expression for the squared worst case error in the reproducing kernel space. Okay, so this involves evaluating the kernel at pairs of states theta i and theta j that are in our representative subset. And it involves evaluating uh, integrals of the kernel over one argument and evaluated at a state in our representative subset and integrals of the kernel over both arguments. And the, the challenge here, which you've probably noticed already, is that everything is circular so far. We can't evaluate those integrals because those are integrals with respect to the posterior p. And if we had p, we wouldn't need to do any of this. So that's a problem. We can't directly evaluate those integrals. So is any of this construction useful at all? Well, my claim is that it can be. And to make it useful, we're going to appeal to a particular family of reproducing kernels that have been developed in the last um, I think seven years, but, but the, the origins of this idea date, date back to the 70s. Uh, and in particular, this paper due to Charles Stein, um, which was published in, I want to say 72, it might be 74. 
So Charles Stein was interested in constructing um, central limit theorems for non-independent random variables. And what that means is you've got a, a random variable that's not Gaussian, it's quite complicated. And you want to measure, in some sense, the difference between that complicated random variable and a Gaussian. But you want to do it in a way which means you don't need to deal with the complicated random variable. You, you would like to avoid computations with that random variable. And that somehow mirrors our problem here, where we want to avoid computations that involve the posterior distribution. So how does this work? Well, uh, there's a particular um, definition and some terminology which I'll introduce uh, that are useful here. A distribution P is said to be characterized by a pair A and F, um, which have names, A is called a Stein operator, F is called a Stein set, if the following holds. So a random variable has distribution P, if and only if the expectation of all test functions of the form A applied to an element of the Stein set is zero. Okay, so Stein is saying, you can characterize probability distributions by exhibiting a large set of test functions for which the integral uh, of those test functions is zero, which sort of makes sense that that should intuitively be possible. But coming up with um, actionable Stein operators and Stein sets is something that's only been addressed in the last few years. Um, here's a particularly useful example of a Stein characterization. So let's, uh, this is considering another reproducing kernel. I've used the notation kappa here. Uh, we're going to focus on parameter spaces that are R to the D. Okay, now, under some technical assumptions, which um, I'm, I'm going to ignore because I'm uh, trying to make up time, then we can say that distribution P has a Stein characterization whose Stein operator is this um, partial differential operator here, and whose Stein set is the, um, the unit ball in a Cartesian product of D copies of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space characterized by Kappa. Okay, so that's, um, that's actually very nice. And well, I can't prove that to you in the space of the talk, but I can show you one direction. So I can show you at least that functions of this form integrate to zero under the posterior. And uh, of course the converse that this set of functions is rich enough com to completely characterize P is, is, a, is a less trivial result. But let's see why these test functions integrate to zero. So let's take an expectation of one of them with respect to a random variable distributed according to the posterior. In one dimension, just to simplify everything, this differential operator just differentiates uh, the product of F and P and divides by P. There's gonna immediately be a cancellation between the denominator and the measure against which I'm integrating. And at this point, we have the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I've used a very formal notation here. But clearly, if f does not explode in the negative infinity, positive infinity limit, uh, and if, if p vanishes, as it will tend to do, being a probability distribution, this thing's going to be zero. Okay. So we can see that these test functions are going to integrate to zero under some regularity conditions. And the, the idea that these are a sufficiently rich class of test functions to characterize the posterior is something that needs proving, but has been proved. Okay, so that's a quick crash course in Stein's method. Um, we're going to use this idea to construct a worst case error um, uh, that's computable in the context of Bayesian statistics. So how do we do this? We take some reproducing kernel K, uh, sorry, kappa, and we apply the Stein operator to both arguments. So we're creating a new reproducing kernel Hilbert space with kernel K subscript P which you can think about as being um, uh, a, like a base reproducing kernel Hilbert space to which the Stein operator has been applied. So what does that function KP look like? Well, that reproducing kernel involves things like the derivatives of the kernel kappa that you started with and quantities that are um, like the gradient of, uh, oh, sorry, my, my notation has jumped around a bit. Uh, lowercase p is gonna be um, the posterior density here. So it's the gradient of P divided by P. And the, the complexity of this is, is sort of misleading. The key point here is that these ratios will not involve the normalization constant of P. So if you've got a, um, uh, a, a, a density for P that you know up to a constant of normalization, well, then you can work with that density here because the normalization constant will cancel in these ratios. And furthermore, because of um, this 
uh, this, this equality here, which is called the, the Stein identity, the fact that these test functions integrate to zero. We know integrals of this kernel are going to be zero too. That follows from um, sort of basic properties of reproducing kernels. So if we use, um, uh, if, if we're able to obtain a Stein characterization of our posterior, which we are due to this general result, then we can obtain a, um, we can obtain a rich class of test functions whose expectations with respect to the posterior are known in closed form, allowing us to compute um, a measure of difference between the posterior and any empirical distribution that we're interested in. So here's how it looks. So we take this specifically constructed reproducing kernel Hilbert space and, and the, the unit ball in that space to define a worst case error that allows us to strike out the two intractable terms in the, um, <clears throat> in the expression for the worst case error, leaving us just with uh, this particular sort of quadratic type uh, form. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's called a B statistic in statistics, which looks at all pairs of states theta i and theta j that are included in our empirical approximation, computes this uh, KP kernel evaluated at those two inputs and averages these values. Okay. That's been introduced um, uh, in, in the machine learning literature where it's be become called the kernel Stein discrepancy. So the key thing is that we can use this kernel Stein discrepancy to uh, explicitly compute a measure of difference between the posterior P and the empirical distribution of any subset of samples from the NCMC output. So we'd like to know that that's actually a meaningful measure of the, the, the difference between these distributions. And this actually can be shown as well um, using ideas from applied probability and science method. So here's just a, a half slide summary of the main results here. So it's known that convergence in kernel Stein discrepancy controls something called weak convergence, which is the sort of standard notion of convergence in probability. Uh, it can be metrized using something called the Dudley metric, but essentially this is weak convergence of the empirical distribution to P. We also know that kernel Stein discrepancy detects convergence when that convergence occurs in the Wasserstein distance. Okay, so if the empirical distribution converges to P in Wasserstein, then the kernel Stein discrepancy will converge to zero as well. So there are some caveats there. You need to choose the base kernel kappa in, a, in an appropriate way. It needs to have heavy enough tails to, um, to detect um, non-convergence. And a particular choice that works is something called the inverse multi-quadric kernel, which I've not written down, but is, is standard. Okay, so we've got a computable measure of the difference between posterior and a representative um, subset, or, or rather the empirical distribution corresponding to a representative subset of the Markov chain output. And we know that if we can minimize this kernel Stein discrepancy, then this empirical distribution will converge weakly to the posterior distribution. So that's fantastic and it suggests an algorithm. Now, as I said before, I'm not going to solve a combinatorially hard optimization problem. I'm gonna do something much simpler, which in this case is greedy optimization. So what I propose is the following. I'm gonna select one state from the Markov chain sample path to start with, and I might as well select the one that maximizes the posterior probability density. I can do that without the normalizing constant. And then I'm gonna sequentially add one state at a time. So each state is going to be chosen such that when I add it to my current empirical approximation, I get a new empirical approximation that minimizes the kernel Stein discrepancy between this new empirical approximation and the posterior. That's just a greedy algorithm. And what does that look like computationally? It involves minimizing over all states visited by the Markov chain, this particular um, sum here. So I, 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 for, for a new candidate state theta i, I compute the kernel between the candidate state and the states I've already selected. And there's this term here, which, uh, which sort of acts as a regularizer. What's the complexity here? Well, to add the nth point, I need to scan through all n states that the Markov chain visited, and I need to compute a sum that involves n terms. So the complexity of adding the nth point is order m times n. Uh, and you can, you can see, of course, that to add, um, to, to construct an approximation with m points, then the complexity is order n m squared. Now, one of the nice properties of this algorithm is that the Markov chain didn't need to work well. 
And what I mean by that specifically is that Markov chain, it, it could have effectively sampled from a different distribution and provided that different distribution is not too dissimilar to the posterior distribution. Algorithms like this are able to correct for that error. And that's in a sense what's happening when you run a Markov chain from an arbitrarily chosen initialization condition. Your sample path will have some bias in it due to the fact that it was initialized somewhere, which is you know, quite possibly a low probability region. So how can we formalize this idea mathematically? Well, here's one attempt that we made. Suppose that the Markov chain, um, rather than targeting the posterior distribution, in fact, targeted a different distribution, and let's call it Q. Now, this is in some sense a proxy for a Markov chain that is supposed to target P but doesn't work well. But it's also the case that there are algorithms which intentionally run biased Markov chains. And the idea is sometimes it's quicker to run a biased Markov chain. But in any case, let's suppose the Markov chain targeted Q instead of P. Now, provided that Q was not too dissimilar to P, and that's a statement which is made, made um, precise by these, these bullet points, which I don't intend to discuss because of time, then it can be shown the output of this algorithm, which we've called Stein thinning for sort of obvious reasons, converges in the sense of weak convergence, almost surely with respect to the randomness in the Markov chain. Uh, and that's in the limit as the length of the Markov chain goes to infinity, so as n goes to infinity, and as the number of representative states you select goes to infinity as well, that's m. Okay, so that's nice because not only have we uh, compressed the Markov chain, we've actually dealt with all that bias that came from running a Markov chain uh, from a finite number of iterations. So this shows that we can do things like bias removal and correct for um, visiting uh, different regions of the state space with incorrect frequencies. So that's a, a sort of theoretical introduction. Um, actually, that, that cartoon I showed you at the start was, was a real output from this algorithm. So these red states were genuinely selected by the Stein thinning algorithm applied to this problem. And uh, we, we can look at rates of decay of KSD and so on. I'm gonna gloss over this, but, um, but a more detailed empirical evaluation can be found in, uh, in, in this paper here. Okay, if anyone's interested in trying this, and I hope one or two of you may, there's, uh, there's, there's quite easily used code available. We have a website called steinthinning.org, and on there you'll find uh, code that can be used out of the box for Python, for R, and for MATLAB, which I hope covers um, a broad spectrum of the users, possibly uh, particularly MATLAB and Python for this community. One of the themes of this workshop which I was keen to address, but which, which I'm only able to say a little, is um, differential equations. So we've applied these algorithms to differential equation constrained inverse problems. And let me just show you a, a couple of uh, vignettes of, of how this has gone. So on the left here, we've got a toy problem. This, this is a, um, uh, a particular system of ODEs called a Goodwin oscillator. To, um, generate oscillatory trajectories of the kind that are sometimes observed in cellular biology. Uh, and this particular model has four parameters to be inferred from noisy observations of the trajectory of this system of differential equations. What you can see in gray is the output of a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. It starts down here somewhere and it wanders around in an interesting way until it finds the high probability region for this posterior distribution. And what happens when we take all of that Markov chain Monte Carlo output and feed it into Stein thinning is that it returns for us a dozen or so representative states, which are um, uh, summarized as red dots again in this figure here where we've zoomed in. So that's, that's quite successful um, because it's a four dimensional problem when we're projecting into 2D, it's sort of difficult to understand if this has worked well or not, but we've performed some detailed empirical uh, experiments which suggest that it is working well. On the right hand side here, we've got a more challenging example. This is a system of differential equations that models calcium signaling um, and is a subunit within a larger computational cardiac model. This particular system of ODEs has 38 parameters and it's particularly challenging to perform inference for. Um, the challenging uh, thing is that um, these parameters are coupled together in a non-trivial way and sometimes the, uh, the, the, the numerical routines used to integrate the system of ODEs just fails. 
So there's lots of lots of reasons why this is challenging. But the failure of the ODE solve is interesting, right? Because that means any Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm you run is going to be biased because you, know, you can't compute the acceptance ratio um, at some of the states that you visit. So there's a bias in this Markov chain routine. And it also mixes poorly because of the heavily coupled nature of the, um, the, the parameters. What we found here is that Markov chain Monte Carlo can be improved to a finite extent by running Stein thinning. So this is the um, a measure of the difference between the output of Markov chain Monte Carlo and the posterior, which we've computed using kernel Stein discrepancy. And here is the corresponding um, situation for Stein thinned MCMC -MC output. So we claim that we've reduced the bias. And what happens in practice is actually there's a very small handful of states visited by this Markov chain that have a reasonably high probability. Um, and the fact that the Markov chain hasn't really found the high probability region yet means that placing a lot of your probability mass on a small number of most representative states does quite significantly improve the approximation quality, even though what you're left with is still not an, uh, a precise approximation in this instance. So these are just uh, just illustrations of what can be done, and I hope that in the future we'll be able to think about how to extend these to the sorts of problems that, that, that your community are, are interested in, such as um, PDE constrained inverse problems. So let me finish then by just pointing to one or two extensions of this Stein thinning algorithm, which we've begun to explore. One of the challenges that Stein thinning faces is that it scans through the entire MCMC sample path at each iteration when you're trying to add one more red point your empirical approximation. And that can be very slow. In that cardiac example, I think we had uh, something like 20 million iterations of MCMC. So scanning through them was the computational bottleneck. Uh, so a natural idea is to only search through a small subset of the Markov chain sample path. And that makes sense. But the problem is you may encounter a small subset of states where the, there are just no, no useful candidate states in that small set. So we, we actually found a combination of, of two ideas works really well. One is this idea of selecting through a small subset of the, the, the states. That's called mini batching in machine learning. And the, the other thing which compensates for the failure of mini batching is non myopic optimization. So within a mini batch, you're allowed to select more than one state at the same time. And we found that that combination, if you tune the balance of them just right, so your batches are not too big, not too small, you're selecting just enough points simultaneously, you can really improve performance. Um, let's just focus on the right-hand side plot because of time. Here I'm plotting the product of KSD times the time it takes for me to run Stein thinning. So we'd like this y-axis to be low. That would mean uh, fast, accurate approximations. And this light blue curve here is the original Stein thinning algorithm that I described to you in this talk. What we're able to achieve by appropriately selecting mini batches and performing non myopic optimization is massively improve the performance as measured in this way. So the optimal uh, trade off we found here was mini batches of size 1000 and simultaneously selecting 100 states from a mini batch of size 1000. And you might think, well, hang on, selecting 100 states from a mini batch of size 1000, that's a combinatorially very difficult problem to solve. What we actually did there was we implemented binary quadratic programs. So it turns out that this um, uh, kernel Stein discrepancy gives rise to binary quadratic programs. And there are very powerful off the shelf solvers for these problems, which, although they may not um, provably converge within a, a lot of time period, actually give you a very uh, accurate solution or you know, uh, close to accurate um, solution from a feasible set. And empirically, these things work fantastically. If you're interested in this, sorry guys, I, I, I have no idea what's going on, but I got to the end. So <laughs> let me just thank you very much for your attention. I hope it wasn't too disruptive with all the technical problems.